are, Trevor. Great to connect. How are you and how's the tour going? I'm doing well. Yeah, we're um, we're only, gosh, what are we? <laughs> I think we're only, we've only finished the first week of the tour, so we got about three weeks left, but already it's just been, yeah, really beautiful and um, just such a pleasure to, to tour with, you know, somebody that, you know, you're inspired by uh, musically and personally. And um, so it's been a real pleasure for us to be with John and his crew and um, yeah, just lots of good shows and, and lots more to come. So we're, we're, we're blessed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the first time I saw John Butler live was Fremantle way back. And also the first time I uh, saw you live was Fremantle as well. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was beautiful. With, it's a with, great... With Marco. Yeah, yeah, it was a great oh, yeah. gig. Uh, my, my first child was just... Uh, she was like six months old. I had her strapped to my chest and we went out for the first oh, night uh, in months and it was a really deep experience actually like it was the first time I'd seen you live and it was just a really deep profound experience and I literally had a vision of you as a wolf I thought I should share that with you because it was really it was really vivid and powerful and I was sharing it with Joe today my wife as we were reflecting on that because she introduced me to you and I was like remember I was having that just tripped out vision of you as a wolf and it was just awesome huh that is heavy yeah yeah (laughs) but it was it was profound like you had your big dreads still and you just had this kind of yeah yeah presence that was really um breathtaking (laughs) Oh man, that's so funny. Yeah, and then that's we met so a couple years later at a Ram Dass retreat. It was great to form that connection. Oh, cool. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Good. But yeah, I want to talk about your album, which I'm just loving, The Fruitful Darkness. How did that come about? What a what a name and what a outlay of songs. How did that come about for you? Uh, well, it was a few different factors that came through. Um, you know, the album was really kind of written or um, inspired by uh, my Saturn return, uh, which is, you know, in astrology, it's when Saturn kind of returns to its exact position of when you were born, you know, so it only happens like twice in your lifetime, really. And, um, it can be kind of a heavy time and just a a period of great learning and kind of, yeah, going inside and, and uh, really finding yourself or kind of discovering, you know, what you, what you need to do, you know, or what you came here to do in this life, what you came here to learn, you know? So, um, yeah. So, it was really kind of inspired by the lessons and meditations that I was having during those couple of years. And, uh, it's really heavily, you know, based on, um, yeah, the stars and, and what I was really getting into astrology at that point in my life and was, and was really studying it quite deeply and just, yeah, just kind of the meditation stuff during that and then, uh, you know, the title was, uh, was really, uh, the other factor, I guess, that inspired the album heavily was, was a book called The Fruitful Darkness. By John uh, Halifax, huh? Yeah, by Roshi Joan. Yeah. So I was reading the book during my Saturn return and was really, it was really kind of helping me navigate, I guess, that time. And when, when, when the time came to name the album, I couldn't really think of a better title than, than that. It was just kind of like, whoa, like this should be it, you know, and this is really what uh, kind of speaks to me from, um, I guess, from from that period of my life. So I, I, I wrote to Roshi Joan and asked for her permission to use the title, and she gave me her permission. And, um, 
yeah, that's kind of how it all came about. Yeah, it's a beautiful album. And the Saturn Return phenomenon, I think it's worth just chewing on that for a little bit longer f- for people to get, maybe if they haven't heard of that before, to just reflect upon that. The first one for people is generally what, like 27 to 30, around that, huh? Yeah, so the first one is usually for like when you're 27, yeah, to like yeah. 30, 31. Because mm-hmm. it takes a while for it to pass through, you know. Oh yeah. Um, and then the sec the second one is when you're like 58 or 60, you know. Um, and usually the second one is is different than the first. I think the first one is usually really about it can it can be tough, you know, because you're really just going through it. I think you're going through a big transition. I think at that age, regardless, you know. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of the, that's kind of what it's about. And everybody's Saturn, Saturn return is different because it depends on where Saturn is in your chart. You know, when you were born, it depends on what sign it was in. It depends on what house it was in, you know, of course, what degree it's at, you know, so all these things kind of affect that time, that period in one person's life. Yeah. And would you say there's a common experience of one having a kind of crossroads, so to speak, of like, all right, you can kind of do your your uh, the way you've kind of been conditioned to do it, the way your parents did it, the way the, their parents did it, and so forth, the kind of easier conditioned route or the other route of discovery and growth and really growing into uh, into self discovery, would you say that there's that kind of fork in the road kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's a fork in the road. I think that you know, if you, it's it's up to the individual to kind of harness, I guess, or surrender. Not harness, I should say. I, I think I should say surrender to the lessons that that your Saturn return is bringing. You know, because if you I feel like if one tries to, you know, fight it or ignore it or stay in one's conditioned pattern, um, it's just going to be really, really awful. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, so it, it just depends on, you know, how open the individual is to the lessons that are being given to them, you know, at that time. Yeah. So your lessons, your, you were going deep into that book, Fruitful Darkness, as you were going through Saturn Return, huh? Yeah, it was just, it just kind of came in at that time of my life. And I was really resonating with, with everything Roshi Joan was talking about. Mm-hmm. So it, it really helped me. Yeah, beautiful. Now at the Ramdas retreat, I remember you talking a little bit about your story of when you got uh, first signed on your first record label and then you, then you got quite unwell and then came the Saturn return. For people that don't really know your story that well, could you run us through those kind of early days and your kind of childhood experiences into that first signing and then uh, being unwell into Saturn return and then your next kind of evolute into where you are now really? Can you just shortly run us through it i'll try my best to do it <laughs> shortly uh it doesn't have to be that uh, short i'll i'll gong the ball if it's yeah. going too long <laughs> yeah yeah i um yeah i grew up in south carolina in a small town my dad was a musician and kind of always had music around the house ever since i was growing up so it kind of came quite naturally to me to just kind of I guess, slide into music. And um, it's always been a part of my life ever since I was young, you know. And so growing up in South Carolina, there wasn't a lot of access to the arts and uh, expression and things like this. So when I was in 10th grade, I went to, I left South Carolina and, and went to a boarding school in California. It was an art school. Uh, international, you know, arts high school in California. 
And that period was really like a magical period for me because, you know, in South Carolina, I was going to a prep school and uh, it was very kind of strict and, and you had to, you know, we had a dress code and, you know, it's just kind of not a lot of expression, I guess, you know. And, um, and so when I went to this art school, it was really like just kind of quite the opposite. My whole world kind of burst open and where, you know, arts and self-expression and all these things, they were, they were put to the forefront, you know, they were encouraged. And, and I was with kids from all around the world and it really just kind of blasted my world open, you know? And, uh, at that time too, is when I kind of, uh, kind of got influenced, you know, on the spiritual path. And, um, uh, I came in with, uh, Neem Karoli Baba and, um, and kind of, that tradition and those stories and stories of the yogis and the saints and um, was really influenced by or fascinated, you know, with their kind of journey, I guess, of uh, self-discovery. So it was a really uh, intense time for me. Lots of, lots of um, roads coming together and um, it was quite magical. It's really like some of the best years of my life. And then, my senior year of high school, I ended up signing a big record deal with Geffen Records, which is this major, you know, whatever record label in in, in the States. And, and uh, you know, I was kind of set on this, I guess, trajectory path of, you know, becoming like a big whatever star or, 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 or whatever. You know, everybody kind of was talking about it and giving me you know, kind of telling me what was going to happen and how this was going to go and all this stuff, you know, and I'm only 18 years old, you know, just trying to be a kid at the same time, you know, so it was just an interesting period of my life. And I graduated high school. I moved to LA, you know, I had all this money from signing this, you know, record deal, but I'm 18 years old, you know, I don't really know how to what to do with money yet, you know, how to handle money. And, uh, I, I got this big apartment on the beach in LA and, um, you know, was, was, was recording this album for, for, uh, the record label. Um, but I was quite, I was miserable, you know, because I had no friends. Um, I, you know, was recording this album that um, that uh, the record company was w- wasn't happy with, and they wanted to uh, shelve it. You know, and um, yeah, you know, I wasn't in school, I wasn't in college, I, I couldn't go out. You know, because I was underage, so um, it was just a really lonely period, and things weren't really going how I guess everybody was said they were going to go, you know? So, um, but in, in that darkness, I guess, in that kind of struggle, um, you know, I, I became kind of affiliated with this, this, uh, Kali temple in, in Laguna beach. And, um, I I was going down there a lot, mainly because every time I went down there, the monks would cook for me, you know, and, and it sounds ridiculous, but at that time of my life, you know, I'm 17, 18 years old, I don't know how to cook, you know, so I'm living in this apartment in LA and every meal I'm getting is, you know, I have to go out to get, you know, so to come to have a home cooked meal from somebody that's, you know, made with love and um, care it was kind of like a big treasure for me at that time. And I, I kept going down there, you know, because every time I go down there, the, the monks would cook, but also I was attracted to, uh, that path of spirituality, you know, and attracted to the path of, uh, the divine mother, you know, she was calling me, I guess. Um, so out of that struggle came this kind of, yeah, I guess, hunger for my belly, but also hunger for 
community and hunger for a spiritual family, I guess, in a way. So anyway, as time goes on, you know, um, I ended up leaving L.A. and I moved down to Laguna Beach, which is not far from L.A. You know, it's only like an hour. And I was living in Laguna Beach and the record company had 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 a kind of change of management, I guess. You know, one president of the label was let go and then this new president came in. And um, he didn't like the album that I had created. And so he said, I want you to do a whole nother album. You know, so it was a little bit of hard for me, obviously, because I put all my emotions and energy into making an album. And then some guy comes along that I don't even know, you know, <laughs> and says, uh, you got to do another one. So, but I didn't care that, you know, I was like, whatever, let's do another one. So I made a whole new album, you know, this is over the course of like three years, you know, and, um, I make this album and everything's kind of set to set to be released. You know, we're about a month away from the release and they end up dropping me from the label. And uh, it was a tough time, you know, because for three years I had some somebody else telling me, you know, how I should look and how I should sound. And and this song isn't good enough. You sh You should write songs like this, you know. And me trying, you know, as a young kid, it's hard because, you know, you're trying to, regardless of that, you're trying to find out who you are, you know, and that whole period, you have somebody kind of telling you, telling you who you are, uh, which is, it's tough, you know, and um, so when, when I tried to, I guess, abide by everything they said, and then they kind of dropped me, uh, or they dropped me, you know, that was kind of tough for me, you know, but it, it taught me that I had to grow up quick and I had to kind of learn that, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't, you shouldn't listen to anybody else, no matter what, no matter who they are, you know, you shouldn't listen to anybody that's trying to tell you who you are, you know, cause they don't know, you know, and, um, as an artist, especially you should, you should be true to yourself and, and write what's in your heart, no matter what, you know. Um, so it was an interesting period, you know. And and uh, at that time, you know, all this money that I had from signing this big deal, you know, now I got dropped from this deal, this label, and and you know, three years later, I don't have any money, you know. So I'm living in Laguna Beach and. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm broke. And these monks at the, at the temple, they said, well, you know, why don't you just live here until you get back on your feet? Like no pressure, you know, you're here every day. Anyway, why don't you just come here? You can stay here. And when you get back on your feet, you can move out. It can be a week, two weeks, month, year, it doesn't matter, you know? So, so I ended up moving into the the ashram and I ended up, you know, not leaving for like seven years. Wow. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of a funny how it all happened, but, you know, I guess it was meant to be. And I learned a lot um, during that period. But um, yeah, so anyway, to, uh, time went on and I was touring and all this stuff and working hard and, and releasing records on another label and kind of building my career. But um, at the same time was also really, really just um, not feeling well and was tired and wondering what was going on, you know? And um, I ended up getting really, really sick with a, a staph infection and and when I got sick with a staph infection, I found out that, oh, I have Lyme's disease and I have an autoimmune disorder and all these things that kind of all kind of spiraled. And this is when the my Saturn return started, you know. So a lot of my Saturn return had to do with my body and learning to 
listen to my body and slow down and um, take care of myself, you know. Um, and so it was, yeah, that's, that's kind of what happened. I mean, it was a it was a tough time. I think during the sickness, it was a really interesting period with the Saturn return because, you know, I couldn't tour that much, you know. I couldn't because I was so sick and I was suffering from, you know, a lot of fatigue and, um, and it was interesting because I based my identity, you know, on being a musician, right? So when, when the music, when I couldn't tour, it was like, oh, well, well, who am I then, you know? Who, who am I if I'm not a musician, you know? And then also at that period, you know, I was, I, I couldn't go to the temple as much also because I was so sick and I was having trouble connecting, you know, I guess with uh, my path, I guess, uh, or not, I guess my path, but uh, just kind of uh, the practices, you know, my own practices. And so I thought, oh God, well, if I'm not, you know, if I'm, if I can't connect to, I guess, spiritually, I guess on this path, then, then, then who am I, you know? <laughs> yeah. So all these things are kind of being stripped away from me, you know? And then physically I had to cut my dreadlocks because the staph infection was kind of, um, spreading, I guess. And, and, the, and the doctors told me that I needed to cut my dreads. So then physically, you know, dreadlocks are kind of a strong statement of oneself, you know, mm -hmm. physically a defining statement. So when that was taken away from me again, it was like, oh, well, now who am I? Fuck. You know, <laughs> so I felt so I felt really lost. You know, mm. I felt really confused and lost and was like. But when all these things were taken away from me, it was a really powerful time because I had no option right I had no choice but to look within myself and really go deep within myself and say okay well if I'm not this then who am I if I'm not this then who am I who am I who am I who am I you know and and in in India in, in the yogic tradition this is called vichara right which means self-inquiry and a lot of yogis they practice this method they practice so oh, they ask themselves this question, who am I, who am I, who am I? And they continue to ask this question in their meditation. And they use this practice, neti, neti, not this, not this, you know? So, and they say that if you continually ask this question for years and years, you know, it's not just an overnight thing. It's a practice, you know, that you, you ask this question that the small eye will fall away and the big eye, the supreme self, will reveal itself, you know, unto that person, you know. So obviously I didn't have some enlightened, you know, experience where the big eye revealed itself. But during that time, it was, I did have a lot of revelations, I guess, of, you know, asking myself, who, I, who am I, who am I, and and kind of going into a deeper place within myself that, okay, none of these things define me, right? None of these out, outward things define me, you know? Um, this is all just a changing world. Uh, but there is something inside me that is constant, I think, you know, that is um, nameless and formless, uh, but is kind of yeah unborn and and doesn't die and that is a constant place you know the yogis would say it's the atman uh, but yeah so that's kind of the, and then you know the fruitful darkness that album was really kind of the you know, yeah, you have to go into the dark you know at some point in your life you have to go into the places within yourself where you don't know the answers, you know, because in our, in our society in our, especially in our Western society, right. We, we don't like the dark, right. We're so obsessed with knowing things and explaining things and understanding things because it gives us a sense of control, right. 
and we, we like to feel like we're in control. And the questions that we can't answer, right, the things that are vague for us or, you know, death or, or, or uh, what happens after we die or, or, you know, who are we at our core, you know, those can't be, and those questions can't be answered logically, you know, through our rational mind. So we push them away. We push them away. We don't want to be in the dark, right? But when we look at all the, I guess, wisdom cultures of, of our, our planet, right? Um, especially with indigenous peoples and, um, you know, these kind of old traditions of spirituality, ancient traditions of spirituality, they all worship the dark, yeah. right? They all walk into the dark. Mm -hmm. They welcome the dark, right? And the dark doesn't have to be this whole, like, boogie monster, negative, scary thing. The dark can just be the undefined, right? It's the undefined space. And these, these, these uh, you know, seekers of these, these elders, these wisdom holders, you know, they walk into the dark and they don't try to understand it. They don't try to figure it out. You know, they don't try to explain it. They just sit with it. You know, they just sit with the dark and they bow down to it. And, you know, um, and in that process of sitting with it and, um, yeah, not trying to control it, I guess. Mm -hmm. The darkness reveals reveals the greatest the greatest lessons of of yeah, consciousness or, or spirituality or all that, you know. Um, couldn't agree more. Yeah, so that's why it's fruitful, you know. That's why it's fruitful. And I guess my album, The Fruitful Darkness, I guess was my own uh, expression of that journey of my own individual journey of going in like that mm. yeah and I guess it comes back to the teaching of Maharaji of suffering is grace could you feel in it at the time the, the grace of that darkness of that suffering could you feel the grace at the time or just in retrospect uh, not really yeah, yeah. <laughs> Really can yeah, huh? you know you know when you're in it, you know you just it's just you don't it's awful, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna lie, you know, um, if you try to fight it, you know, mm -hmm. I think we, we as a human as human beings are always trying to avoid suffering, you know, and I think the act of like avoidance, right uh is it's only making it worse for us, you know? It's only making it worse, you know? It's like, if we just accept that that suffering was a part of the dance, you know? Was a part of this divine, this, yeah, cosmic dance of creation and, you know, destruction and whatever, uh, I think that we'd have a lot, uh, we'd have an easier time, you know, for sure. Uh, you know, when I was in India last, um, our Guruji, you know, he said to us something so simple, but so it made me just think so much, you know. He said, uh, he said, uh, suffering is, is the point between two moments of happiness. Hmm. And then he said, happiness is the point between two moments of misery. Mm. So be strong, he said. You know, he said, it's always moving. Right? But as a people, we're always trying to just hold, stick to one, you know. But it's never going to be that way. Mm -hmm. That's what this life is. It is always moving. It's always up and down, right? And we should just surrender to the dance rather than trying to control it because we're never going to be able to control it, you know, ever. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Very. It seems like the <laughs> a similar realm even to, like, the depths of true love, like big, big love it seems to be the same kind of 
realm. It's a full surrender, a full trust beyond those dualities, beyond the flickering of the mind. And it takes a real, a real leap, a real courage to go into those realms, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So with uh, Ramdas and Maharaji, when did all of that come into play in your, in your life? Well, the that, connection that with Ramdas and Maharaji. That happened in high school when I, when right. I went to that school in California. I was in 10th grade. And um, so I must have been, I don't know, 16 years old. Mm. And um, I became really good friends um, with a boy at that school named Sam. Um, Sam Marcus is a, is a very talented musician himself. And, um, yeah, we became really good friends and, and, and we were making a lot of music together. And one night, one day at, at school, he said, why don't, Hey, why don't tonight you spend the night in my dorm room? Because we lived in separate dorms. He said, why don't you spend the night in my dorm so we can make music, you know, at, all night, you know, whatever, after curfew, you know? And, uh, I said, yeah, of course. So that night I, I came into his room and I had never been into his room before his dorm room at the school. And he only had one picture on the wall and it was a picture of Maharaji. And I remember when I saw the picture, it was just boom, you know, just hit right away with uh, this feeling that I had never felt before, but it felt so familiar to me. Hmm the best way I could describe it. It just felt so familiar. I was looking at this picture. I couldn't take my eyes off this person. I felt like I knew this person, you know? And I asked Sam, I said, hey, who is this picture of? Is that your grandpa? I remember I said, is that your grandpa, <laughs> you know? And he said, no, no, that is Maharaji. He's an Indian saint. And my dad and brothers were with him in India in the 70s. And I said, well, I, what is a saint? You know, I didn't know anything, you know. I didn't. And he brought out this book, Miracle of Love, you know. And he said, you should read some of these stories, you know. So I opened the book, and I, I remember I didn't go to sleep that night. I just read from the book the whole night. And I just, that was it. That was the moment that uh, changed my life forever, you know. Um, I just, I fell in love with this being that I didn't meet physically, but it didn't matter to me because I, I, I knew that, you know, I was his, you know, and, um, and I didn't reason about it at all. You know, when you look from the outside logical point of view, you know, you're like, oh, this is ridiculous. You how can you fall in love with this person you never knew? And, you know, you're not from India, you're from South Carolina, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> <laughs> was, you know, happened. But for me, I didn't ask all those questions and that's how I knew that it was true, you know, and I loved this being so much. And I wanted, to, you know, because I loved him so much, I wanted to love everything that he loved, you know, so because he was from India, I wanted to love India, you know, because he uh, was a devotee of Hanuman. You know, I wanted to love Hanuman because he loved the Ramayana. I wanted to love the Ramayana, right? So my whole, whole um, spiritual path was based off of my love for this being, you know, and um, that's how it all started was that. Um, that night in that dorm room just seeing his picture, that was it, you know. And now fast forward, I don't know, that was in 2000 and that was in 2003, right? So 16 years later, you know, going to India so many times, going to the places where he was, you know, being with Ram Dass, you know, all these things are from that one night, you know. So it was a blessed uh, event for me, a blessed event for sure.
And I remember you speaking vividly about your first trip to India and how that truly changed your life as well. Can you recall that first trip to India? Absolutely. I remember it so well. I, mm. I mean, I remember, I remember, uh, first time I went, I was 20 years old and, um, it was in 2007, New Year's Day, I remember. And uh, we landed in Delhi, and I remember landing in Delhi, and my first reaction was, oh, my God, I, I want to get back on the plane and get out of here. Because <laughs> yeah. as soon as we landed, I had, never, I had never been that far away from home, and also I had never been in a place like that. And I remember walking out of the airport and just being like, I am in a different universe and yeah. kind of had a freak out, you know. And, uh, but I remember when I, you know, I kind of calmed down, whatever, it's just kind of the initial shock, you know, as so many people and sounds and colors and smells and noises. And, but I remember when I got in the car, we got in the taxi and we, we drove to the Ramakrishna mission. That was the first place I stayed in Delhi. And, um, I remember driving in the car and I was like, oh my God, this is it. I was like, this is it. This is, this is, this is what I've been seeking, you know? And, um, it was just, it was kind of that same feeling of when I saw Maharaji for the first time, it was like, this is it, you know? Um, and, um, yeah, there was so many magical things that happened that first trip, but I think the, the thing for me that, was is still one of the high, the greatest, I guess, spiritual experience moments of my life was when we were in Allahabad. Um, and Allahabad, you know, is the home of Dada Mukherjee, who was one of the, you know, great devotees of Maharaji. He wrote two of my favorite books on Maharaji, By His Grace and the Near and the Dear. And, um, you know, reading by his grace, you know, I used to skip class in Idlewild mm -hmm. high school and go off into the woods and just read that book for hours, you know. And um, so to be in the same city, you know, as as Dada Mukherjee and where all those kind of stories of Maharaji took place, it was very exciting for me. Uh, but the day came when you know, a car was arranged for us. You know, I was traveling with a few monks um, that from the Kali Temple in Laguna Beach. And they had arranged the car to try and go find Dada Mukherjee's house on Fort Church Lane, you know. Um, and, um, yeah, we got in this car and we were driving through Allahabad and we came to church lane and I remember driving down church lane and kind of having this funny feeling in my body um, like something was going to burst you know mm. um, like all this tension was building up or something it was weird and um, as we got closer to the house I began to cry you know not mm. like not like cry like for any particular reason you know it just it was like, I don't know, it was just happening. It was the, the most interesting thing. And we pulled up in front of Dada's house, and um, I just had this overwhelming feeling of Maharaj. It, just, I, it was just like so thick. It was almost scary. It was just like, and I just burst into tears, just... Um, it, it was real, you know, it wasn't like in the books anymore. It was like, this really happened. Like this being really was on earth. And this being really walked here and ate here. And um, yeah, it was just so powerful. And I remember I got out of the car and the first thing I did was I just fell to the floor, fell to the ground, the dirt. And I started grabbing all this dirt, you know, I was like a crazy person. I was grabbing all this dirt and putting it in my pocket. 
because I thought his feet touched the dirt. Mm-hmm. You know, my beloved, my the person that I love, you know, so intensely. He was here. He touched this dirt, you know, and I was just grabbing this dirt, grabbing this dirt, putting it in my pocket, just weeping, sobbing, you know. And I was like, oh, God, I was I was also embarrassed because, you know, Dada Mukherjee's family, they still, his niece is the one who runs the house now, you know. They live in it just as Dada Mukherjee did, but they keep Maharaji's room exactly the same as when he was there, right? So Dada Mukherjee, his, his niece comes out, you know, of the house and I'm embarrassed. I'm like, oh my God, she probably thinks I'm this crazy person, this white <laughs> kid, you know, sobbing, you know, putting all this dirt in my pocket. And she just comes out and she says, come, come, you know, it's okay, come, come. You know, imagine that happening in like a Western country, you know, <laughs> that would never happen, you know. And she took me by the hand and she led me straight into Maharaj's room, you know. And I just walked into his room and his tucket is there exactly how it was when he was there. And it was just like a lightning bolt, man. It was just everywhere I turned, I just saw Maharaj. Um, And I knew that, you know, this was real. You know, you didn't have to wonder oh, am am I crazy or am I his or am I not, you know? Um, It was just a, oh, it was just an explosion of the heart. And, um, yeah, that was it. I mean, that that day was just um, probably one of the most amazing days of my life, you know? Wow. Um, yeah, that was it. So that that trip, that first trip was a. Re- it was just kind of this confirmation for me in a way. You know, it was like, yep, I'm real and I'm watching over you, and my love is real even now that I'm gone physically, and none of this was an accident. You know, mm-hmm. and all of this was supposed to happen, and don't. Don't worry. Now you can just relax. Okay. You know, so it was, it was powerful. Yeah, that's beautiful. Now I know you've been, um, doing more of your concerts more in a devotional way. And every now and then you do slides of Maharaji and every now and then a a mantra or an invocation. Do you, can you see possibly you moving more into the kirtan thing or do you think it's just going to be a kind of a flavor that you bring into what you're already doing i i think that i don't think that um you know like the kirtan i guess thing is kind of my service you know Mm -hmm. um you know it's it's kirtan for me isn't isn't entertainment right um Kirtan is a deep, um, yeah, a deep practice of, of the heart. And, um, you know, I look at it as a sacred thing, as a practice. So, um, not saying that my Western music or whatever to me is not sacred or anything, but, you know, it's, it's obvious to me and, and clear to me that my service is to express and share these songs that have been given to me mm-hmm. um, you know and uh, I like to share you know obviously where these songs were inspired from you know or what they were inspired by and, and so naturally that you know Maharaji and India and these stories make their way to the forefront eventually you know yeah. um but a lot of it, you know, I, I like to just share what I can, but, um, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of that is, is also personal too, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's a balance. It's a balance really. Yeah. Yeah. 
just before, just earlier today, I was listening to one of your earlier songs from um, Chapter of the Forest called Haleakala. And uh, she, mm. she, just be, before me even talking about Haleakala, she, she picked out the word because we spend a lot of time on Maui and she does hula up on Haleakala and she's got a deep, she just knows the place very well, I'd love to just hear of your connection to Maui and how that Oh Haleakala song got created for you. Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that I was, we were actually on our honeymoon, uh, my wife and I, and we went to Maui. Uh, she, my wife uh, has some family that has lived on Maui for like 40 years or something. Um, and, uh, yeah, we just chose Maui or Maui chose us, you know. And when we went to Maui, you know, I hadn't been there for a long time. And um, and uh, we were staying just below Haleakala. Um, and I couldn't help but, you know, hear her vibration and yeah. hear her... Uh, um, hear her talking you know mm. and so I just picked up this guitar and and the song kind of came through and uh, and up until that point I had never even been up to Haleakala I was just you know sitting at her base at her feet um, and it wasn't until I don't know a year or so later that I went up to Haleakala for the first time and um you know, it's just, it's the house of the sun, like, like its name is, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, it's luminous and, and clear and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, you, you feel her so strongly and you mm -hmm. feel like this is the living thing, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting right now, you know, feeling that, especially with everything that's going on right now with Mauna Kea on the big island um you know i've never been to the to the top of mount k i've been you know again at the, at, at the base of her feet and already mount k has you know affected me so deeply um but imagining a, a something being built on the top of mount k or something mm -hmm. being built on the top of aleakala um there's no doubt in my mind that some type of disruption would take place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so whether it's bad or good, I don't know. But um, in my mind, you know, I'm not a Hawaiian person. I, I can't speak for the Hawaiian uh, culture and ancestry and what it means to them. But I am a person and I am a child of Mother Earth like we all are. And, um, yeah, to put something up there just doesn't feel right, you know. Mm -hmm. So, because you can feel that magic, you can feel her talking, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's interesting. But, yeah, Haleakala is a dear place to me, a magical place, a temple, you know. Totally. For sure. And you've you spent quite a bit of time on Maui, didn't you? Live there for a couple of years or something like that? Yeah, yeah. we lived there for a winter. We mm -hmm. lived there just for the winter one year, but we've you know continued to go there many many times. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a dear place for us. Mm. Now, Trevor, we'll gradually wrap this up, but I think a nice way to uh, make our way there It'd be nice to speak about what do you feel like it is to get out of the way and let your gifts flow through you? What does it feel like to you to get out of the way, to be in the flow? Oh, it's hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, a t it's a tough thing to do, you know. Um, I mean, it's constantly evolving and changing, you know, mm -hmm. every day. Uh, but um for me it has a lot to do with surrender you know yeah and um i don't i can't speak for others but in my own individual you know 
I think that I've come to some place of surrender within myself, you know. Mm. I'm like, oh, I've really surrendered, you know. And then something happens that next moment or day or whatever, and I'm like, wow. So I have no idea what it means to, like, fully surrender, you know. Um, surrender is a deep, deep um, subject for me. And it's one in my life that I ponder on greatly, you know. Yeah. Um, the strength, of, the strength of surrender, and um, you know, getting out of my own way, like you're asking. I mean, with music, that's one of the. That's why it's so healing for me. It's because it, I naturally get out of my way. You know, when I'm playing music, and I'm in a state of surrender to the sound, to the process, to the dance, you know, um, and so for me, it's about kind of taking that moment of being in sound, being in the mantra, and bringing that vibration to every aspect of my life, every moment of my life, not, not just when I'm playing music and, you know, whatever, um, but when I'm walking, when I'm talking, when I'm I'm cooking, when I'm meeting other people, mm. um, when I'm trying to make decisions, you know, for um, if yeah, it's just about bringing that space of surrender into every aspect, you know, every aspect. Yeah. Um, what it's about totally it's such an interesting one in our culture where we uh we love a pill we love a an instant remedy but this surrender thing it's a it's a practice <laughs> oh it's, it's a, a lifelong thing and surrender isn't something that you learn mm -hmm. or like you like read a book about and then go out oh i'm gonna go out and surrender <laughs> you know it doesn't work like that it's a natural unfoldment, you know, in your process of, as a human being. And, and it's something that you can eventually choose to do, you know, mm -hmm. um, or not. A lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people want to be in control and, um, the horn, you know, they say, live life that way no matter what's thrown at them you know um it's like when we look at look at the great you know at, when we look at this world and we see world government all these things you know no matter how many storms blow through or hurricanes that ruin or you know earthquakes all these things we still feel like we're in control. We still think we're in control, you know? Yeah, it's, it's just so funny. It is right? very strange. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, Trevor, so glad to connect, and thank you for taking the time while you're touring. Yeah, I really so appreciate much. it. Is there anything you yeah, want to uh, leave it off with and, and let the listeners know about? Oh, no, I mean, right now we're just, yeah, we're on tour, and it's funny you're calling from Fremantle because John, you know, we're on tour with John Butler Trio. Yeah, who, he lives just around the corner. <laughs> he, yeah, he grew up around there, so. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we just, we're on this tour now and doing this this summer, and um, that's kind of the main thing on our books right now, but. Yeah, we're just moving forward and, and um, another day, another dream. Beautiful. Well, I love your work and just love what you're doing. And thank you again for your time and best of luck for the tour and keep rocking it, man. Much love. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, Take care. Deep gratitude. Thanks, Trevor.